I'm feeling really positive about uh, women and their prospects. When I was running the first time, it was 1992, the year of the woman. So everyone was really excited. They would see me at the door and say, oh, yay, a woman is running, you know, after the, those horrible Clarence Thomas hearings. And then the next year, we actually lost ground and lost some women. And we never had a year like that again, I don't think, until the current times when I think it's a good climate again for women. And so now I think we have even higher ambitions. We don't just want women elected, sitting in seats, but being disregarded or not listened to. So in Minnesota, you know, the fact that we have Susan Kent and Melissa Hortman, I think speaks volumes. Women have arrived. Even though I got elected in 1992, we were in such a minority in our caucus. All the leadership was male. That was a totally different time. Voters was crucial in my being involved in politics at all. Before I joined the league, in 1980, I didn't even, we hadn't settled on a political party. I'd been raised by a mother who was a moderate Republican. She was a Democrat through and through before she died. But back then, my dad was a Democrat. We didn't um, discuss politics. I had one of each in the family. So I actually uh, thought I was a Republican to begin with, following my mother, who was more involved in my life. Even though my town of Roseville was hugely populated in 1980 by Republicans, I switched over then because I just felt a political home with the issues. And I became an issues person all due to the League of Women Voters and my powerful mentors there. So I try to mentor myself because I benefited so hugely. And um, the reason I got on the school board in the first place, which I then take to heart for all women running for office is I was recruited I didn't even, um, even though I sat there and watched um, this one man vote wrong on pretty much everything that wasn't unanimous, I still um, hadn't thought of running myself until a friend of mine who was in the league, who was on the school board said, Mindy, you've got to come and help. <laughs> we're, we're not winning anything here when it comes to controversial votes or divided votes. Um, so for Pete's sakes, get your hat in the ring. And that was all I needed because I'd sat there, I knew um, I was hoping someone else would run and I could help them, but it was easy to recruit me because I had been there, I'd seen what was going on and I'd become an issues person and would get educated on the issues. And the ones who asked me who were influential were my League of Women Voter friends who said, um, you know, we'll help you. So my best mentor, um, Anne Barry, in terms of uh, recruiting me to the legislature, said, well, ask uh, so-and-so to be your treasurer and ask this person to do that. And I said, well, I'll ask them and they probably won't want to do all that much work. But if they do, if I can get all these major positions, then I'll run. And I thought then I might not have to because I thought they would say no. And in truth, they all said yes. So then I was kind of stuck. <laughs> and uh, I was a very hard campaigner. I had the best workers in the world. I had that same treasurer, George Ann Hall, who also was um, one of the bookkeepers at the League of Women Voters of Minnesota. Um, she was my treasurer for the whole time I was in the legislature for 20 years. Imagine that. So these loyal, hardworking, league-type people and um, and then I got elected to the legislature and actually hated it to begin with, partly because of the repressive um, atmosphere for women. And, uh, but then I came to see that I could survive and I could thrive. So then I liked it, <laughs> but not at first. Please, we have so many um, BIPOC people that are in the legislature and they've become so powerful. And a lot of them, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of them are women. So I think that is a huge advancement. When I was in the legislature and I left in January of 2013, when my term was up, I left by choice. Um, there really were not very many people of color. Rita Moran was new 
in the house and fairly new and getting her footing. And um, so to see her now be the chair of Ways and Means, I'm just so proud, you know, of her and what people have have done. Uh, Jamie. So I think, um, you know, the movement for more women in the legislature, and I did uh, chair recruiting um, for a, a short period where we got more. I worked with the uh, Women's Candidate Development Coalition, Shirley Nelson. There wasn't um, women winning yet at that time. And we double teamed a lot of candidates knowing that they needed to be recruited. And she had contacts around the state from working in local government. And um, so we recruited an all time high that has not been exceeded until this past election. So it took, you know, we tended to slide back because there wasn't intentional recruiting of women. If you don't intentionally recruit women who think they're not ready or they just don't come forward as much. And I'm, I thought that that would have changed between when I was running and now, but I keep hearing that. You probably hear that Mickey being involved in the women's movement, that that's still the case. You know, women need more encouragement. We're so conscientious and we think we need to know every issue backwards and forwards and how to run a campaign. And so we should wait until we get to that point. And then, then of course, pair in there and take the spots and then maybe they're there for the next 10 or 20 years and women are not, um, not well represented. So, so there must have been intentional recruiting this time, that last time in order to get that many women women or the women just came forward. You know, the African-American women, the black women who ran in huge numbers this past time as a reaction to George Floyd's murder and, you know, just the, the times, it's time, you know, kind of like the human rights amendment at one time when I was new in the legislature, now it's time for more people of color to be at the seats of power. And it looks to me and just the few that I do talk to, it looks to me like, um, like things are moving really well. But what's changed, of course, is how partisan it is. When I was there, we could actually work across the party lines on legislation. It, it had changed considerably by the time I left. And now it seems to be people are locked in cement in, in many cases. So that's very unfortunate. Do you feel like you can characterize sort of how you think women approach leadership uh, differently in general than men? Well, I think that might be, um, you know, up to the individual to a certain extent, but um, generally speaking, women like me, at least, who came up through the League of Women Voters and Girl Scouts and PTA, you know, we're very into delegating and sharing power. And that, I think, is the best of women leadership and that men haven't traditionally embodied that type of leadership as much. And um, you know, there's notable exceptions. I got to work a lot with current representative, uh, Carlos Mariani. He had education policy when I had education finance. And he was very much, um, we worked so closely together. We sat next to each other on the house floor. And um, so I hate to always say all men are this or that because there's clearly exceptions, but, um, but generally speaking. So when I was the chair of education finance, which I finally got to be a chair, you know, more than halfway through my 20 years, because um, you have to be in the majority, you have to be senior, you know, some of those rules are now being broken to fast forward, um, you know, people of color and women, um, but that wasn't done in my day. And so, um, so it took a long time, but when I finally got to be a chair, I made sure everyone on my committee had an important bill. I met with them to see if they didn't already have one to see which one they wanted or what they would like to be in charge of. We always did the final bill, the omnibus bill um, as a caucus. We didn't work bipartisanly on it, but we did work all the, all the Democrats on the committee came up with our bill and then the Republicans did the same and they would have a bill and then we would take the best of both. And of course there was a lot of overlap and the majority party took the most of their own bill, if not all of it, and maybe some of the others, but it was um, always working together. And that's how I operate. I must have a group thinking. I just think, you know, more heads are better than one. Uh, you do your best work if you have expertise from others. You know, I had, 
Kathy Breinert from Mankato was the education policy person on testing and standards, et cetera. And then when that topic came up in the committee or in a caucus or anywhere, if we got into the weeds, we could call on her to be the one to have studied that and know exactly what was going on and so forth. And that I think is, is definitely a style that I learned in, all, in the women's community. And uh, I think it's the best leadership and men who do it um, are served much better. If you're trying to be the expert on everything yourself and you get asked a question in the weeds, then good luck to you if you can't manage to master every single thing and every single detail. You deserve what you get if you're like, well, I, the, the, yeah. 